Hello, everyone. And I would like to welcome you to this uh, Lyme Wellness webinar. Um, I'm very excited to have you join us today. My name is Dr. David Roberts. I'm Dean for External Education here at Harvard Medical School. I want to let you know first and foremost that today's webinar is being recorded and that a recording will be shared with all of our registered attendees uh, today. So thank you for joining us. We're very excited to get started. We have a fantastic program for you today. Um, I uh, want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Office for External Education. We uh, create programs, courses, materials for the world. Uh, to bring the best of Harvard Medical School and our faculty to people like you. And we interact with not only patients and families and people who are interested in health and wellness and medical science, but also clinicians and people who want to become clinicians, as well as companies and uh, people who want to learn more about health and uh, medical care as it relates to the business that they are in. Uh, Today, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the Lyme Wellness Initiative. This is uh, something we are very fortunate uh, to have and to have created with the, a, a gift from the Fairbairn uh, Philanthropic Fund back in 2020. And the idea was to create educational materials that raise awareness of Lyme disease among the general public, people like you and across the world, and to help people who have Lyme disease and improve their quality of life. Now we launched a website, uh, it's called www.lime.health.harvard.edu back in July of 2022. And it's really for people who wanna learn the basics uh, about Lyme disease, as well as people who are living with Lyme disease or caring for someone who has Lyme disease. As part of this project, as part of the overall Lyme Wellness Initiative, we conducted a survey of, of people ab about Lyme disease awareness and uh, trying to understand um, what people understood about Lyme disease and Lyme disease prevention. We were very fortunate. We had 4,000 responses to this survey. And one of the most important things that it taught us and that we wanted to share with you is that there are lots of misconceptions about Lyme disease. It's complicated. And so, one of the things that we want to do, because there were there were misconceptions about what Lyme disease is, how it's contracted, and how you can prevent it. So that's the the, the information from that survey is what we use to kind of recognize what we we see as a gap between people's knowledge and their interest in learning more. And so we wanted to provide you in this webinar and in our materials with accurate information that you could trust and that you could understand. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're gonna do today. This webinar is uh, titled Staying Safe Outdoors, How Understanding Tick Biology Can Help You Avoid Lyme Disease. And I think one of the things that's important, I happen to be in the Boston area and with fall and you know, it used to be that we only thought about uh, this problem, Lyme disease, is something you had to worry about in the summertime. But you're going to hear today that this has really become an issue year round and that there are different spikes in uh, Lyme disease across the time. Um, and anyone who spends time outdoors is at risk for Lyme disease, and which, according to now the Centers for Disease Control, affects almost half a million people a year. That is an enormous number of people. So key, key information, prevention of tick bites is really how you avoid this bacterial illness. And it, it's important to recognize that this disease can come, become very serious if it's not treated early on. So today um, we are very fortunate to welcome a true expert in this, Dr. Isabel Renai. And um, she's going to explain what, what is it about ticks that makes them a particularly challenging threat for all of us. And, you know, what we as individuals can do to avoid them and safely enjoy the outdoor, outdoors. Um, she'll share some information about what we don't know about ticks, not only what we know about ticks, but what we don't know about ticks, and explain why those remaining questions need to be addressed. And 
talk a little bit about her own research about ticks and how it relates to all of this. Now, after uh, her presentation, we are going to have a question and answer session. And we've already received some amazingly important questions from, from you. And we will not be able to accept new questions during this program. But um, I, I do want to remind you that you can always send us questions. We're always interested in hearing from you. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Renai, who's uh, here uh, with us. Dr. Uh, Isabel Renai is a Life Sciences Research Foundation postdoctoral fellow of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. Her current research focuses on the genetics of the black-legged tick, the tick that carries the bacteria that causes Lyme disease and is going to be the focus of our attention today. The goal of her research is to de develop novel tick control strategies that will reduce the, the tick-borne disease burden that, and that we all have. She completed her PhD at the University of Sydney in Australia. It is really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Renai and uh, hear from her today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, David, for that kind of introduction. And I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you all about a topic that I am very passionate about, and that is raising awareness about ticks and the diseases that they cause. So I first became uh, aware of the huge health threat that ticks play uh, for both humans and animals during my PhD. And I was also shocked at the time to learn about how little we actually know about the biology of ticks. And what I'm going to share with you today is some of the things that we do know uh, about the unique biology of these uh, animals that cause a huge burden of disease in the world. And uh, it's some of the information that I wish I would have known before I even became a tick biologist. So ticks hit the media headlines quite a bit. Uh, these are some great headlines that I just pulled up from some recent articles. So there's Articles such as ticks, they're not just for hikers anymore, and the ticks are winning. Uh, and they hit the media headlines a lot because they do have this major health impact on humans and other animals. The disease that the ticks are most associated with, particularly here in the United States, is called Lyme disease. And uh, what a question that some people have is what actually causes Lyme disease in the United States? And it's caused by a particular species of bacteria called Borrelia. And here in the United States, there's actually two species of Borrelia that causes Lyme disease. So the most common one is called Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, and then the second uh, type of bacteria here in the United States is called Borrelia mayoni. These Borrelia species have a very specific physical characteristic in terms of their shape. They're little spiral shapes. And this is why scientists sometimes call them spirochetes. And here's a microscopy image uh, that some scientists have taken of the bacteria. And all these little squiggles here, they are the bacteria under the microscope. Uh, and you can see them here in the green and the little red squiggles. The way that this bacteria actually is delivered into, uh, the hu into humans and other animals is through the bite of an infected tick. The ticks are very small, and unfortunately, sometimes people are even unaware that they've been bitten by these ticks and become infected and then end up contracting Lyme disease. For some people, the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease can be relatively straightforward uh, and they can recover. But for other people, uh, the diagnosis and treatment journey is not straightforward. And for these people, they can end up uh, contracting a lot of different symptoms. So things like uh, joint pain, there's a rash that is commonly associated with Lyme disease, but it's not present in all patients. You can get uh, issues with your heart and also the nervous system uh, is a common complaint from people affected by Lyme disease. Importantly for these people, the condition can be really debilitating and absolutely ruin their quality of life. And that's why it's so important to be aware of ticks being out in the environment and also how you can prevent getting bitten by a tick and then being infected with this Borrelia bacteria. And it's not just a little uh, issue here in the United States. Uh, there's approximately half a million cases of this disease every single year 
uh, in the United States. And that's a huge problem uh, for the population. And I wanted to point out that this number is just an estimate from the Centers of Disease Control that they use from insurance data. We currently don't have an accurate number uh, for how many cases of this disease is happening every year. And in terms of where most of these cases are occurring, there's particular disease hotspots uh, that we particularly see in the northeastern region of the US and also the upper Midwest region of the US. So these are particularly risky areas uh, for Lyme disease. While uh, Lyme disease has been and is currently a big risk uh, in the US, it's also a growing risk. Uh, so these are two maps from the 2000 and 2019, so a space of two decades. And what it shows is that the cases of Lyme disease have been both increasing in number, and you can see that with the darkening of the colors in these uh, hotspot regions, and then also not only an increase in number, but also the geographic spread of this disease. And you can see that by looking at the orange colors and how they've spread, uh, particularly in these hotspot areas. So this has uh, been a huge, uh, issue in the US and is a growing issue in the United States. So far I've been talking to you about the disease, but I did also want to introduce uh, the key tick player in this story. Uh, this tick is known by a few different names. Uh, you might hear it called the black-legged tick. Colloquially, it's also sometimes called the deer tick. And in scientific circles, we have named it Ixodes scapularis. These are some uh, microscopy images that a student that I worked with here at Harvard, Kaylin, has taken, and it really shows at high resolution what these ticks look like. Uh, the ticks here are the adult female, Ixodes scapularis, and the adult male, Ixodes scapularis. They have an overall similar body shape, so they both have eight legs and sort of oval uh, body plan. But they also have some sex differences. So the females are about one and a half times as big as the males. And also the females have this uh, unique sort of additional part of their body, which is orangey red. And interestingly enough, it's this black uh, shield or scutum that we call that makes up the whole body here of the male. So that's why it's only black in the male. Uh, so this is the tick and it that's associated mainly with Lyme disease in the United States, but it's not just Lyme disease that this tick is associated with. There is actually five additional diseases here in the US that uh, this tick is associated with, and I'm going to walk you through in the next few slides these additional diseases. Uh, I'm going to show you some maps of where these diseases occur in the United States, but I want to stress that these are where the reported cases of human disease are happening. And potentially these diseases could be happening outside these uh, ranges that I'm showing you today. The first disease uh, that I wanna bring your attention to is called anaplasmosis. It is also another bacterial disease similar to Lyme disease. And it's found very much in a similar region uh, as the Lyme disease cases. So there's lots of cases in the Northeast and upper Midwest. The second disease uh, that I wanted to bring your attention to is called hard tick relapsing fever. And this is a relatively new disease uh, in the United States. It's been identified associated with the black-legged tick. And I've put here reported cases so far because it's so new, there is actually a lot of states that are not yet reporting on whether this disease is present there. What we do know so far is that this disease has been found, uh, uh, people are suffering from this disease in the Northeastern regions and the upper Midwest. And finally, another bacterial disease uh, called ehrlichiosis. There's a particular subtype of this disease that's associated with the black-legged tick. And so far it's been reported in two particular states, uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. So these are all the bacterial diseases that the black-legged tick has been associated with, but there's also some other types of disease. There's one that's quite similar to the malaria-like parasite. That's called babesiosis. Uh, and it's found very much in the coastal regions of the Northeast and also a smattering in the upper Midwest uh, area. And so that's four diseases so far. And then the final disease that I wanted to bring to your attention is called Powassan virus disease. And this is caused by a virus this time that the tick is transmitting. It's very much uh, a smattering across the Northeast and Midwestern regions. And it's of particular concern to people because it's the tick-associated disease here in the United States with the highest or one of the highest fatality rates. 
And it's estimated that up to 15% uh, of people uh, that are contracting this disease are uh, dying. Uh, and it also has no uh, available treatments at the moment. So that's why this disease is a particular concern uh, in the human population. So what I've been talking to you about so far is the single cases of disease, but that because they're all caused by this single tick species, the black-legged tick in the United States, it means that from one single bite of these ticks that you could be contracting multiple different microbes that can cause disease. Uh, one thing is though, we don't have a good handle of how common uh, this phenomena is. So what I'm showing you here is a recent systematic review of this, uh, of these co-infections that are happening. And what they did was look at humans where they've been infected with the Lyme disease bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, and then looked at whether there were other microorganisms uh, that these humans were encountering. They were estimating that approximately 6% of Lyme disease patients have a co-infection, so have one of these other potentially disease-causing microbes. Uh, but more research is definitely needed in this area. It is also, this is on the human side, but it is also reflected on the tick side of things of what we know uh, is found in the ticks. So this is a social media post from the Upstate Tick Testing Program in New York. And they were reporting that they had uh, ticks that were near humans and they had two of the these ticks that had four different microbes that could cause disease in them. So these ticks were infected with the Lyme disease bacteria, the uh, bacteria that causes anaplasmosis, the parasite that causes babesiosis, and also the virus that causes Powassan encephalitis. So this means that if someone was bitten by these ticks, potentially there could be four different uh, microbes that cause disease uh, being transmitted to them. And these people can then end up very, very unwell. And we're not sure about what the interactions between all these different uh, disease causing microbes could potentially be for the human population. In, this has sort of been the microbe side of things, but also on the tick side of things, uh, things are changing and uh, with the ticks, and this is also amplifying our disease risk. One of the things that has been amplifying the disease risk and uh, a lot of people talk about is climate change. So the increasing temperatures is increasing the range where ticks can be able to survive. And one of the best examples of this is the northward expansion of the black-legged tick uh, up into the Canadian region. So this is a uh, tick surveillance map uh, from the 2008 and 2012 period. Uh, in gray is the United States and in white is the Canadian region. And along the border region, uh, they've got these insets where they're showing where they surveyed for ticks. Anywhere that there were red dots is areas that they were finding the black-legged tick back in 2008 to 2012. And anywhere where these crosses are are areas where they were not able to find the black-legged tick. What uh, this study showed at the time is that the tick was very much found along that border region between the United States and Canada. But this is about 10 years ago now. And if we look at some more recent surveillance uh, called passive surveillance of people submitting ticks uh, where they were finding them, what we see is that there's been a northward expansion of the black-legged tick uh, further into Canada. So all these red dots are areas where the black-legged tick has been uh, shown to be present and it's very much moved from just along the border region with the United States up north into uh, further into Canada. So this is definitely amplifying the disease risk for people uh, in Canada and there's been an increase in uh, risk for Lyme disease in these regions. And this is just one uh, environmental change that's affecting the tick populations. A uh, second uh, environmental change has been uh, humans changing uh, the habitat uh, in terms of fragmentation with uh, human properties and vegetation uh, and also urban greening. So this is changing the animal hosts and wildlife that the ticks are feeding on and being brought into people's backyards and increasing the interactions between humans and ticks and therefore increasing the chance that you're, you could be getting a tick bite and then a tick associated disease. And finally, another major environmental change that's happening is the introduction of invasive tick species. So in a really good example of this is that in 2017, uh, we first identified the Asian longhorn tick here in the United States, uh, where it's an invasive species. It had previously not been reported as established in the United States. And as of today, uh, this tick is now found across 19 states uh, in the US. 
and it is causing a particular problem for the local cattle industry here. So all these environmental changes are really compounding the risk uh, of getting a tick bite and also uh, these tick associated diseases. So next, what I wanted to tell you a little bit about is some tick biology 101. And hopefully you'll learn something new today that you didn't previously know about ticks. Uh, I wanted to start with the family tree of ticks. So these are the ticks here. And I've got some spiders and some mosquitoes. And if we look at this family tree, what we can see is that uh, the common ancestor of ticks and mosquitoes was quite some time ago, uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago. And it was actually relatively more recently that the ticks and spiders that their common ancestor was about 570 million years, sorry, 500 million years ago. What this means is that ticks are actually not insects. Uh, they are closer relatives to spiders. And you might be able to see that uh, when you see a picture of a tick next to a spider, they look relatively similar to each other. In terms of the biology of the ticks, there's also some interesting differences to other disease causing uh, insects. So for something like a mosquito, they have relatively short lifespans. Uh, something like 14 days is a typical lifespan for a mosquito. Whereas for the ticks, they can live for hundreds of days, if not over a thousand days. And what this means is that the ticks are present in the environment for, lot, for a lot longer periods of time compared to something like a mosquito. I also wanted to introduce you not just to the black-legged tick today, but also some of the other tick uh, ticks that are present in the United States. So there's different types of ticks, different species. I've already talked to you about the black-legged tick, but there's also the dog tick, which is uh, scientifically named Dermacenter variabilis. There's also the lone star tick, which is called Amblyoma americanum. What I'm showing you here is pictures of the adult females of each of these species. And if you can see, they physically look a little bit different each species. And that's really important uh, to know that because each of these different tick species is associated with its own suite of diseases. So I've already mentioned to you uh, that the black-legged tick has six different diseases that it's associated with. But if we look at the uh, dog tick, uh, it's associated with two different diseases itself. So associated with the disease called tularemia and also Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And then the uh, Lone Star Tick is associated with its own uh, unique set of diseases. And there's actually six of them here in the US. One uh, is tularemia again. There's ehrlichiosis, which is a different uh, subtype to the one that the black-legged tick is associated with. There's something called STARI, which stands for Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. And there's two uh, viral diseases called Heartland virus disease and Bourbon virus disease, and these are relatively uh, rarer. And then finally, there's something called Alpha-Gal syndrome, which is one of those tick-associated diseases that has really been hitting the media headlines quite a bit recently. Uh, and you might commonly know it as called uh, the red meat allergy. Uh, so I wanted to show you today that there really is a whole uh, suite of diseases that these ticks are associated with. For the rest of today's talk, I'm very much going to focus on the black-legged tick and Lyme disease because uh, that is the tick-associated disease that has the most cases here in the United States. Uh, and I'm going to really dive into the biology of this black-legged tick to hopefully give you some more awareness about how you can be preventing tick bites from this species. I'm going to walk you through the uh, tick life cycle for the black-legged tick and how this influences the Lyme disease risk. So when you start with ticks, they start their life as these eggs. And it's from these eggs that they hatch into their what we call their first life stage. And this first life stage is called a larvae. And when the larvae emerge from these eggs, they are very hungry. And the food that the ticks like to eat is blood. Uh, they're not too picky. Uh, so they particularly like to go and find some small, uh, maybe a small mammal like a mouse, and they'll take the blood from these mice. Uh, importantly, if these mice are infected with the Borrelia bacteria that causes Lyme disease, then the tick uptakes the blood, but also this bacteria and the tick themselves becomes infected. So the tick uses this blood uh, meal and uses that energy to then transition to their next life stage. And for the ticks, that's called a nymph. And these nymphs are slightly larger and bigger. 
and they will go out and they, again, are hungry and they need a second uh, blood meal. They'll go and feed on uh, another mouse or something like that, use that blood and transition to their final life stage, which is called the adult life stage. These adults are very, very hungry. They like a lot of blood. And so one of the things that they will do is find a very large mammal, such as a deer, to feed on. They will use that blood. And it's particularly the black-legged females that are feeding on the hosts at this adult stage. And the females need this blood to produce their eggs, lay their eggs, and then that is how the life, life cycle starts all over again. What I really want to point out here is because of this unique life cycle between the tick and its host and the bacteria, what this means is that there's only two stages of the black-legged tick that can cause Lyme disease in humans and pets. So it's particularly the nymphal stage and the adult stage that are of uh, risk to humans. And what I'm showing you here so far has been those cartoon drawings of ticks. And I just wanted to show you uh, this image that I very much love uh, that we recently took of the ticks in the different life stages against a one cent coin, a penny, which hopefully can show you how tiny these ticks are. So this is the little larvae. The nymphs get a little bit bigger and then the adults get a little bit bigger again. So this is the adult male and the adult female. But compared to a one cent coin, these are very, very tiny. And just to show you this in a different perspective, uh, on a human, this is how big the ticks look. So this is a black-legged tick female, the nymph, and the larvae. And so the larvae are just tiny little dots compared to a human. And this is one of the reasons why it's so easy to miss seeing a tick on you and being bitten by a tick. Also, uh, in terms of the biology of these ticks, when what life stage they are and when they're present in the environment uh, changes. So they have peak activity periods throughout the year. If we look at when the uh, peak activity period is for the nymphs, it's during early summer. It's then later during summer that the larvae emerge and then the adults have a peak during fall, but they're present during the whole of winter as well. What this means is that ticks are active during the whole year and that any time that the temperature is above freezing, that you're, you're potentially at risk of getting a tick bite. I particularly also wanted to draw attention that as the nymph and the adult stage, as I was mentioning on the, that earlier slide, that they are the ones that are infected with the Borrelia bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So they are the stages that are particular risk to humans and pets. It's also particularly in summer when most of the Lyme disease cases are occurring. And that is because summer is a period that we like to be outdoors and enjoying the environment. And also it's the period where these nymphs uh, have their peak activity, which the nymphs are a bit smaller, so they're harder for people to see. And a lot of people don't realize that they're being bitten by a nymph uh, black-legged tick. So this uh, is definitely a peak uh, period for risk in terms of Lyme disease, but any time of year, you could potentially be getting bitten by a tick uh, and at risk of Lyme disease. In terms of uh, what we know about the biology of the ticks and where they like to hang out, the main limiting factor for ticks is uh, their dehydration. So what that means is that the ticks like to be in environments, particularly where it's moist, uh, so any moist vegetation, either natural or human maintained. So whether that's in forest environments, in vegetation environments uh, at the back of human property, or even in your backyard, uh, there's potential for the ticks to be in these areas. Once the ticks are in these areas, the way that they find a host, they have a very specific behavior, uh, which we call sort of an ambush strategy. Uh, they're very much like a right place, right time kind of uh, animal. And I do get asked a lot, but ticks, they cannot jump and they cannot fly. So the way that they find a host is they sit in this vegetation and can climb up. They sit there and they have a specific behavior where they'll wave their two forelegs about as shown in this picture. And if there's any uh, host that's brushing past, that's how the tick will get onto you. Uh, they, so it's very much limited to that sort of uh, passive sitting and waiting strategy. Once the ticks are on you, uh, they have some very favorite places to bite. So there was this great study last year looking at where uh, humans are finding ticks biting them. And it's very uh, tick species specific and also life stage specific. So what I'm showing you here is the adult black-legged tick, and they particularly like to bite people uh, in the groin area and also the head region. 
Whereas the immature tick uh, life stages, they seem to have a preference for the groin area and the lower leg area. So these are areas that you should be particularly aware about when you're doing a tick check to see if there's any uh, ticks potentially on you. Once uh, the ticks get on you and are wanting to bite, they have some very specialized mouth parts. So this is an adult female black-legged tick picture that we've taken and then blown up. This is what their uh, mouth parts look like. It's very much this central bit here with all these backwards facing barbs that that's what gets embedded into your skin. Uh, they're sort of like little mini harpoons and they're embedded there in your skin. And that's one reason why it's so hard to remove the tick. It's not like a mosquito where it's very much in a uh, quick bite and out. The ticks are very much uh, specialized to stay in your skin for long periods of time. They often feed for days on, pe on people or other animals. And so this really thwarts their removal uh, in terms of trying to get them out of your skin. It's not just these specialized mouth parts that the ticks have, they also have some very unique saliva uh, that they use to prolong their uh, feeding. So this is an image of a tick feeding and shown here in this sort of cloudy picture is what's called the salivary glands. And it's this, these salivary glands that deliver specialized saliva into people's skin and also potentially the microbes. So if this tick is infected with something like the Lyme disease bacteria, that the saliva can then uh, deliver this uh, microbe into the skin. I've shown you those specialized barb mouth parts that the ticks have that allow them to be really anchored into the skin. And the ticks have another strategy, which is called uh, producing a cement cone. And as the name suggests, that really, again, cements the ticks, uh, locks them into the skin. And then this saliva has some very unique properties uh, that helps the ticks stay embedded so that the host is unaware of being bitten. There's things that increase the blood flow uh, into the tick so it can keep feeding. There's also immune suppressive agents that uh, dampen down the, any immune response uh, to the tick feeding on the host. And there's also anti-inflammatory agents, which means that the host uh, might be completely unaware that the tick is feeding on them. And this is one of the reasons why for a lot of people, uh, they might not even be aware that the tick has bitten them. And next, I'm just going to talk to you about what we do know about tick biology and how this advances what we uh, our prevention tips for reducing the risk of a tick bite. So there's various different strategies that you can take uh, to prevent a tick bite and reduce your disease risk. And sort of at different stages. So before even going outdoors, you can prepare uh, for going into a high risk environment. One thing that you can do is wear clothing that obstructs ticks uh, getting onto you and access to your skin because they need that access to your skin to be able to bite you. So things like wearing enclosed shoes, socks, long clothing, they are all helpful things. Tuck in your clothes, uh, anything that's going to limit the tick movement and uh, obstruct their access to your skin. And also any clothing that makes them easier to spot. So I've been showing you lots of pictures today of the ticks. They're very dark colored, uh, which means that if you wear light colored clothing, it's much, much easier to spot a tick. It's one reason if you ever see a tick biologist out in the field, they're often just completely dressed in white. And the reason why is so it makes it a lot easier to see if there's ever a tick on them. The other thing that you can do is if you're in high risk environments a lot is treat your clothing with something that will kill the ticks on contact. And the best chemical for that is something called permethrin. Uh, you can either uh, send your clothes uh, out to be treated with permethrin, you can buy pre-treated permethrin clothing, or you can treat yourself, uh, any clothing that you have yourself, you can treat uh, with the chemical and make it uh, effective against killing the ticks for at least a period of time. And then you can just reapply um, once the effectiveness wears off. So the last thing that you can do before you go out is also apply tick repellent. There's lots of safe and effective tick repellents out there. The Environmental Protection Agency has a great list of things that are effective, particularly against ticks. Uh, that's really important. And something, an example of this would be something like DEET that you can use uh, and you want a, an active ingredient, something about 25% 20, and above has a really good long-term effectiveness for a few hours while you're out in the environment. So these are all things that you can do before going outdoors. Once you're actually outdoors, some things that, some strategies that you can take 
is I've been mentioning that the ticks really like to hang out in those vegetation areas where it's more humid and moist. So if you're looking at a path like this, anywhere that there's this gravel uh, or dirt, there's very unlikely to be ticks hanging out in this area. But anywhere in this vegetation on the side, that's where the ticks are potentially going to be. So that's why people advise you want to stick to the middle of the trails where there's less likely, less likely that you're going to encounter a tick uh, because they're going to be sitting there on the vegetation waiting for you to brush by to get onto you. They're not going to fly onto you uh, from those vegetation areas. The other thing to do is also be prepared if you do encounter a tick and get bitten. One of the best things to do is remove the tick as soon as you spot it on you. And there's different strategies that I get uh, asked about quite a bit. Uh, so I want to mention, please do not burn a tick, uh, apply Vaseline to a tick, nothing like this. You want to use something like a fine tip uh, tweezer, that is by far the best thing to do. Those ticks are embedded, as I was showing you those images, those mouth parts are very much embedded in your skin. So you wanna carefully remove them with these fine tip tweezers straight out. And as I've been mentioning, it's very important to know, or it's very helpful to know what tick species has bitten you and also what life stage of tick has bitten you. So I can advise that you could uh, keep the tick for later identification. What you can do, one of the safest ways to do that, ticks are very hard to kill. Uh, so using something alcohol-based is one of the best ways to kill a tick. Uh, one thing that a lot of people might have access to is alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So you can put the ticks in these hand sanitizer in some sort of enclosed bag or vial and then leave it for later identification. This is all while you're outdoors, uh, but then really importantly, as soon as you get back indoors, you can take steps also to reduce your disease risk. One of the best ways to spot those tiny ticks that are potentially on you is doing a tick check. So you wanna remove any ticks before they've bitten you or as soon as after as you can, if they have bitten you. So take off all your clothes, uh, getting into the shower really increases your chance that you're gonna see the tick uh, and be able to remove it. And it's not just on yourself. If you have other family members and particularly pets, they could be uh, other vehicles that are bringing the tick into your home environment. So it's really important to check them when, they're, when you're coming in from the outdoors. And the one thing that you can do is anything that has been with you outdoors, either leave it outdoors so that the ticks are staying, any potential ticks that are on them are staying outdoors, or alternatively, the one thing that is really effective in terms of killing the ticks that are potentially being brought in on your clothes uh, is putting them in the clothes dryer. So the heat of the clothes dryer is going to dry the uh, clothes out, but also the ticks out, and that will uh, be able to kill them quite effectively. So these are all strategies before you go out, while you're outside, and then as soon as you get back home that is uh, been proven to reduce your disease risk and uh, hopefully uh, stop any tick bites from uh, happening. And I think this is really important because uh, the Lyme disease initiative who's running the talk today, they the survey that they ran of people who, of what people know about Lyme disease, they were, uh, what the response rates were showing is that only about 20% of people are undertaking these prevention measures, which means means that there's a huge percentage of people out there who are not doing these just simple uh, steps that are potentially going to be very helpful in reducing their disease risk for diseases such as Lyme disease. So I really, really want to encourage you today to take these steps whenever you're outdoors and at risk. The final thing that I wanted to talk to you today is a bit about some tick biology research. So what I am currently working on and also some of the big unknowns that we have uh, for the tick biology research world and why that's why these unknowns are really important to answer in terms of uh, public health and reducing Lyme disease risk. So I wanted to uh, tell you about a particular project that we worked on and I was very interested in this question of why Lyme disease and some of these other tick associated diseases that I've been talking about today, why they seem to very much happen in those northern regions of the United States and not in the southern regions. We published this recent paper. So this study was led by a PhD student, Julia Frederick, and uh, supervised by uh, Travis Glenn, both at the University of Georgia. And what this study did was we looked at the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis, associated with Lyme disease, 
Uh, and we looked at this tick across the whole of its range in the United States, and we particularly were looking at its genetics and whether that could tell us anything about the risk of, uh, of these ticks and how that impacts the risk of Lyme disease. What I'm showing you here is a map of what where the black-legged tick is located in the United States. And I just wanted to mention uh, that there is another sister tick species that is also associated with Lyme disease. That very much happens on the western coast of the US uh, that I haven't really talked about today. So this is the black-legged tick Exodi scapularis. Its range is on the east coast here. And in red is the established distribution of this tick species. In yellow is its estimated distribution. A lot of this estimated distribution is just waiting to be filled in. There's these counties up here in yellow, and the chance that there's uh, no ticks present there, I think, is pretty low. Uh, there just needs to be a lot more surveillance done on this tick. Uh, but the main takeaway from this map is that the tick is very much found across the whole of this eastern half of the United States. If I show you again some of those uh, disease uh, maps that I was showing you earlier, uh, here in green is the Lyme disease cases, in purple is the anaplasmosis cases, and in gold is the babesiosis cases. There's very much a distribution up here in the north of where these uh, disease cases are occurring. That means that there's actually a mismatch between where the ticks are and where the disease cases are happening. So I'm going to show these maps side by side to point this out even um, more obviously. And down here in the south, I wanted to mention there are a few little smatterings of uh, cases happening here, but a lot of these are actually what we classify as travel cases. So these are people who might have traveled into high risk areas such as the Northeast, contracted a tick bite and then a di Lyme disease, and then they come back home to their home counties and the disease is reported in these home counties. So there's very little uh, Lyme disease risk uh, in this Southern part of the United States, but there's definitely the black-legged tick uh, being present in these counties. So what, what is potentially causing this mismatch? The way that we answer this is by doing a massive surveillance study of the ticks across the whole east, uh, eastern half of the United States. So we had some collaborators and we collected 350 black-legged ticks across the whole eastern half of the United States. This covered 33 different counties and that's represented by each of these red circles here on the map. So each of these are locations where we were able to get some black-legged tick samples. Uh, and importantly, we were covering uh, ticks that are located not just in this high-risk area where there's over 95% of Lyme disease cases shown in this gray shading, but also uh, tick populations that are down here in the south. Once we got these ticks, uh, we extracted the DNA from them and then looked at uh, the DNA variants that are uh, found in these ticks. And the reason why we wanted to do this is look at the genetic uh, differences between ticks from different regions of the United States. What we found is that there's actually five different population clusters of the black-legged tick across the whole eastern half of the United States. And they're represented by these different colors here in gray, orange, yellow, red, and blue. What we were most excited to see is that in those areas where there really is a high risk for Lyme disease and those other tick associated diseases, there's specific tick populations that are associated with these high risk areas. And they're shown particularly in blue and gray. We then looked at the genetics of these ticks and we were able to identify particular genes that might be associated with these ticks and the high disease risk, which is very exciting. And this, has been uh, sort of the start of the project. Uh, so we've identified that there's specific black-legged tick populations that are associated with this greater Lyme disease risk, but there's still lots of questions that remain of what uh, what's the genetics behind this? What are the potential mechanisms behind this? Uh, so there's lots of questions that uh, still need to be answered uh, to look at why there's this such higher disease risk happening up in the north northern parts of the United States. Which then really leads me on to uh, sort of the wider tick research community that there's a lot of questions that remain that I would love to see answered and I think would have a huge impact on our understanding of the tick biology and also how this is impacting disease risk for humans and other animals. So I'm just going to briefly talk about some of them today. The first one is uh, I would love to know how common uh, are co-infections in ticks. I've talked about earlier 
that there's a lot of different microbes that these ticks can be carrying and then transmitting to humans. We really need some good estimates of how common this is uh, and how often this could be happening therefore that people are, are getting sick with multiple different diseases. And also then that leads to the question of how many human tick associated diseases are there in the US? And you might think that this is an easy answer to, or easy question to answer, but it is actually not. And just in the past two decades or so, the Centers of Disease Control have identified seven new diseases that are associated with ticks. And I think a lot of the time, one issue is that these diseases are being identified retrospectively. People are ending up very sick in hospital, and then it's been later found out that they are infected with a microbe that's been contracted from a tick. So we really need to be more proactive in this space uh, to see and identify what diseases are potentially out there and affecting people's health. I'm also very interested in the question of having a more fine-grained understanding of how long it is taking a tick to transmit the Lyme disease bacteria. So uh, it's definitely uh, the centers of disease control advise within 24 hours, uh, you need to be removing the tick, but I would love to understand the mechanisms behind this in more detail. And it's also not just the Lyme disease bacteria that the tick is transmitting. If there are any other microbes, the uh, transmission time varies between the different microbes. So for some of these viruses, it could be as few as 15 minutes that it takes for the tick to tr transmit it uh, to a human. Then I am also personally very interested in the question of are some people more attractive to ticks than others? We know from the mosquito research field that they have identified that some people's uh, skin is more attractive to the mosquitoes than other people. Uh, ticks have a very different uh, host seeking strategy than the mosquitoes, but is it something about certain humans that makes them more attractive to uh, ticks out there in the environment? And then sort of leading on to some of where my current research is headed, uh, how can we effectively control ticks? So we don't currently have any long-term effective control strategies that are being systematically applied at the moment to control tick numbers. And as I've talked about today, the disease cases uh, associated with ticks are a huge problem at the moment and they are only getting worse. So we really need new novel strategies uh, being developed at the moment to counteract these ticks and really stop them at this nexus of uh, all the different diseases that particularly the black-legged tick is causing today in the United States. And that really leads me on to uh, the topic that I really think that there needs to be more tick research happening uh, both in the United States and more globally. And I write about this issue quite a bit. So if anybody's interested to read more, uh, I wrote this article on tick management programs could help stop Lyme disease, but US funding is inadequate. So I would uh, ask that you go and read some more and we really do need some more tick research happening to better understand the tick biology and be able to develop these new strategies to limit their numbers and reduce disease risk for both humans and other pets. And I am going to finish up there. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing the tick Q&A and answering some people's questions that have been submitted. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Renai. That was fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it is uh, great to uh, hear all that information, and I think there's a lot there for all of us to process. I certainly have not seen a tick up close like that before. That was uh, somewhat shocking and striking to see their mouth parts and body parts and to understand, um, certainly someone who has pulled ticks off myself and off my children, um, it was good to understand that. So thank you for sharing all that amazing information. Um, we have some fantastic questions. We have questions uh, um, about some of the things that um, uh, I mentioned in the beginning, some misconceptions, some, some big questions out there. We don't have time for every question, but I'll just rapid fire ask you a bunch and then we'll, um, and we'll see how many we can get through. So um, first question is you showed a lot of pictures of the United States. Um, is tick, uh, is uh, Lyme disease the same around the rest of the world? Yeah, so Lyme disease is not just a United States issue. It's found globally, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, so countries uh, in Europe and Asia. 
But depending on where you are in the world, it is caused both by different tick species. Uh, so often other exodes tick species in different areas of the world and also different uh, bacterial types. So different Borrelia species are found in places like uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, so Lyme disease is around, but just slightly different variants of it and slightly different ticks. Got it. Um, then focusing on the black legged ticks, um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, you, you described that there are these different populations of the ticks with different variants of the bacteria. If we were to take hundred or a thousand ticks, do all of them have the bacteria in them or only some of them? Yes, great question. So uh, to reiterate something that I mentioned in the talk, uh, the black for the black-legged tick, it's only the nymphal stage and the adult stages that can be affected with the bacteria. But then it also is very much which region of the United States that you're in, uh, whether what the risk is and what the percentage of the ticks that are actually infected with the bacteria. So in some regions, the infection rates of these ticks can be very low, but in regions which are really high risk, so particularly the northeastern region where we're located, uh, in some regions, up to 50% of the ticks can be infected with the uh, Borrelia bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Got it. Um, one of the questions uh, that I thought was important is uh, somebody asked, you know, if I, as a patient, have Lyme disease, I got it from a tick, but if I got bitten by another tick or another insect, can that be transmitted to another person that it then bites? Yes, uh, that's, a, I think, a very important question. And as one that I had before I even got into this tick research field. So for other bugs or insects that are out there, we know that they're not uh, able to both acquire the bacteria from animals and then main, they've got to acquire that bacteria, uh, maintain the bacteria and then transmit it to another host. So we know for other insects and bugs that that's not possible. In terms of other uh, for tick species, there's a lot of tick species that we also know that they're just not able to uh, pick up the bacteria and then transmit it to other hosts. And we do this through uh, laboratory experiments. Uh, so very controlled conditions. And we uh, look at whether the ticks are infected and able to transmit it to another uh, animal. The question of whether the black-legged tick uh, can acquire it from a human, I think, is an open area. And some very interesting research that I'm seeing happening at the moment in this area is actually using the black-legged tick for what's called xenodiagnosis. So where people are putting uh, the ticks on potentially infected people and seeing if the tick can then uptake the bacteria from these people. So I think that's definitely an area of active research happening at the moment. Great. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, one of the things, again, we spoke mostly about adults. There are questions about kids and um, are children at greater risk for Lyme disease? And at least again, my kids, my kids are outdoors a lot. There is it. And what are the ways in which um, kids are different than adults in terms of uh, acquiring uh, tick bites and Lyme disease? Yes, so the two age groups that are at most risk is definitely children and also sort of uh, elderly adults in the 50s, 60s range. They are definitely the two uh, groups that are most at risk. In terms of why children are at higher risk, uh, the ticks aren't changed. It's not different ticks that are biting the children. Uh, so it's very much that the ticks are present out there outdoors in vegetation environments. And we think that it's that children like to be in those environments and are out in those environments a lot more in these riskier areas compared to maybe an adult. And so that's what's increasing their risk uh, is that they're basically in those high risk areas with ticks. So it's particularly important to be checking your children as soon as they come indoors and also applying uh, tick repellents and things on them to really uh, reduce their disease risk. Fantastic. I'm smiling not because tick uh, disease is so um, uh, humorous, um, but rather your comment about 50 to 60 being elderly. I all suddenly didn't realize that I'm in the elderly category now. So that is great. <laughs> I love it. So I'm just I'm just playing with it. There we go. Uh, one quick um, question about prevention. So a lot of people have wondered about sunscreen and mosquito repellents. You mentioned certain types of clothing, those which have permethrin, which is a, a, a repellent embedded in it. Um, what are really, you know, if people, uh, they walk away with a message about things like sunscreen and mosquito repellents, what do they need to know? 
Actually, I want to pick up on just something you were mentioning there. So permethrin is the one thing that will kill the ticks. So it's not a repellent. It'll kill the ticks. Then, so I really see that as like one group or one action that you can take. And then the second action is having these repellents. So they're called repellents because they will repel the ticks away from biting you. Uh, they don't actually kill the ticks. So the repellents, are, it's important to note that uh, I was mentioning in my talk that ticks don't have the exact same biology as mosquitoes. They're not an insect. So while there are some repellents that will work both on ticks and mosquitoes, there are others that are just there that are only effective against mosquitoes. So make sure that you're reading the label that it's going to be effective against the ticks if that's uh, particularly a concern to you in the environment that you're in. Uh, so the Environmental Protection Agency has a great list of things that are effective either against ticks or both ticks and mosquitoes if that's important to you. In terms of sunscreen, uh, the general advice is that it's probably better to apply them differently. They need different types of applications onto your skin, so it's better to deal with them separately uh, as separate treatments. Great. Thank you for clarifying. Um, you know, maybe the last question is um, a little more philosophical. So first, you know, who are the natural enemies of ticks? And do they have any value? Like, is there a good aspect of ticks? And if we got rid of them all, what would happen to our ecosystem? I do get asked this quite a bit. Uh, so for the ticks, they are the ultimate parasite. So their life history is very much about going out, getting blood and using that to progress through their life cycle and then be able to lay eggs for the next generation. Uh, currently, there's no, we don't know of any animals that their like sole food source is ticks or that are having a major, major impact on reducing tick numbers. Uh, and we're seeing massive increases in tick numbers and uh, disease incidents across the United States. So it's really important to be thinking about what are some alternative strategies that we could be taking to control the tick numbers. Thank you. Dr. Renai, thank you. Thank you so much. We don't have enough time to uh, continue uh, answering all of the questions, but I just want to remind people we have some amazing resources on our website, lime.health.harvard.edu. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Renai, for sharing such important information, both um, background information, key information that everybody should know if they're going to be outside. And we really hope that people will get outside and they will do that, they will do that safely. I want to thank all of my colleagues across external education and Harvard Health Publishing who were able to put this together and bring this information to all of you who were able to join us today. I wanna remind you that um, the recording is available. You, you will get the link to the recording. We would love your feedback about this uh, session today. And finally, I'd like to thank the, the Fairbairn uh, family and the, the gift that they uh, have given us um, really with the purpose of sharing information and trying to reduce the burden of Lyme disease across the United States and across the world. So thank you again, Dr. Renai. Thank you again, all of my colleagues. Thank you to all of you, all of your participation today. Um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Be safe outside. Have a great day.